All right, good afternoon. I'm here to talk to you about foreign policy, Donald Trump's foreign policy. Um, and I'm going to try, I'm going to try to s see if there's any coherence to what seems like a lot of incoherence and to see whether we can figure out, is there some type of logic, rationale, is there some sort of intent to what oftentimes appears to be chaos? And I think there is. Uh, now, all of us know that uh, keeping track of what's going on with Donald Trump is very difficult. It can be overwhelming. Oftentimes, it feels like we're trying to drink, uh, take a drink of water out of a fire hose, right? <laughs> Just so much is coming at us all the time, so much information. And it's, it's you know, how do we keep, we, we can't step aside and just take a pause for a moment because it's nonstop. And the reality is, we're missing things. We're missing stories. We can't possibly keep up with all of this. And that can be a bit dangerous. And I'll give you an example of a story that I think we've missed. Uh, last week, there was a story that broke about Ukraine. It was a back-channel foreign policy deal between the United States, potentially between the United States, Russia, and Ukraine over fighting in eastern Ukraine and Russia's annexation of the Crimea. And there were four individuals involved in this. Uh, Michael Cohen, who is Trump's personal attorney, a Ukrainian politician, Paul Manafort, who is the former campaign advisor who's now working with this Ukrainian politician, and a business uh, associate of Donald Trump named Felix Sater. And we're going to spend just a minute talking about Felix, because he's kind of an interesting cat. Um, he claims to have had a very close business relationship with Trump. Trump has said, well, we weren't that close. But nevertheless, they've taken pictures together. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, Felix. So uh, Felix has been accused multiple times of threatening to murder former business associates. It's not very nice. Uh, he was also convicted of a mafia-linked stock, uh, stock fraud scam. Convicted. Not allegations, convicted. Uh, and most fantastically, in 1995, he served 15 months uh, for stabbing an individual in the face with a broken margarita glass. <laughs> Let's step back for a second and think a little bit about that. This story broke last week. You may have heard something about it. You may have missed it, but it wasn't talked about too much. And what does that say when somebody who's involved in a behind-the-scenes, potentially huge foreign policy deal uh, has threatened to murder people, has been convicted of stock fraud, and has stabbed somebody in the face with a margarita glass, right? We're losing some perspective here. Uh, but what's happened is the world, I think the American political community has said, it's too much. There's too much fire hose. There are certain stories that we just have to set aside and muck. We can't talk about it now. We'll get to that later, right? And, you know, did you hear Donald Trump said the press is the enemy of the people? We can't talk about a guy, you know, a margarita face stabbing guy. Hashtag margarita glass face stabber story, right? Uh, there's just too much. We have to take a break. Uh, and so the fact that all that was happening last week, that this didn't get a lot of attention, speaks to the pace of events. And so what I would like us to do is turn off the fire hose for a few minutes and step back and assess what's really happened foreign policy-wise. And then in the process of doing that, I think we'll see that there's a, there's a clear strategy and intent with the Trump administration. All right, let's start with the team. Let's start talking about the individuals on this team. Uh, basically, all the, the heavy hitters are there. The individuals are in order. Uh, there hasn't been too much change. One change, uh, uh, National Security uh, Advisor Michael Flynn was fired. He was having conversations with the Russian ambassador to the United States about lifting sanctions during the Obama administration. Can't do it. It's illegal. And then even worse, he lied about it to Vice President Mike Pence. Uh, and then the media found out about it, and then Trump fired him, and he was replaced with the National Security Advisor, H.R. McMaster. All right, so there's, there's a couple things. These, these guys have been very, very busy. And I think part of the reason they're so busy is they've been arguing with each other, and they've been contradicting each other. Uh, it's very clear there are two camps that are emerging within the Trump administration. The camp on this side and the camp on that side. And I would call the, this one camp over here, I'm calling them the guardian of the old guard. These are the pragmatists. These are the individuals that look at uh, foreign, U.S. foreign policy from World War II on as seeing a very consistent. These are the individuals that believe in NATO. They believe in the strong U.S. alliance structure. Uh, they believe in free trade. They believe that the United, United States has a role to play in shaping the world environment. Right? These are bipartisan in that sense, that they're, they're following a very consistent practice. They mistrust uh, Russia, they don't want to revisit that relationship. Uh, these are the guys that you're probably used to. And to be honest, if Hillary Clinton had won, she might have picked a couple of them. 
So this is the old guard protecting the old order. And so we've got Mike Pence, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, Secretary of Defense James Mattis, Nikki Haley at the UN, Homeland Security John Kelly, and then the most recent H.R. McMaster, the old guard. All right, kind of boring guard. And then we've got this side. These are the anti-establishment radicals. These are the Bannonites, right? These are the bomb throwers. These are the guys that are saying like, let's just mix it up and see what happens. Uh, these are the guys that are openly against globalization. They're against free trade. They're excited about revisiting a relationship with Russia. Uh, they have no problem uh, with this idea of economic nationalism, that the United States should turn inward and worry about American economic interests and worry about American culture. These guys are also very comfortable connecting terrorism and Islam. And if you think back to the pr two previous uh, presidential administrations, the, the Obama administration and the George W. Bush administration, both of them were very clear to say Islam and terrorism are separate things. And we should not make the mistake of conflating them. These guys don't have a problem with that. In fact, openly argue that the only way to understand terrorism is to understand Islam. Very, very controversial position. So these are the guys that are looking to disrupt, cause chaos, trouble. They often call them the bomb throwers because they're looking to create chaos. And there's a quote from Bannon uh, that he said, we allegedly said in 2013. He says he doesn't remember saying it, but I think it's pretty powerful. Uh, he says, I'm a Leninist. Not Leninist in terms of the communist Lemon Leninist dynamic. Uh, Lenin wanted to destroy the state, and that's my goal too. I want to bring everything down and destroy all of today's establishment. That's heavy, right? That's a big deal. That is the White House chief strategist saying he wants to see the system burn. Uh, he's also senior advisor to the president, Stephen Miller, is also very much of that ideology, and the deputy assistant to the president, Sebastian Gorka. Very similar mindset. So we're seeing this divide in the White House right now. And I think this goes a long way in appreciating some of the craziness, some of the chaos that we've seen. Uh, the question is, now where's Trump in all of this? And I think we're also seeing a pattern here as well. Uh, Trump, these guys have his ear. The Bannonites have Trump's ear. They, you know, they're whispering stuff. And I think he wants to listen to them. And on some level, this makes sense. Because this group is talking about blowing things up. And think about Trump. He loves craziness. He loves you know, challenging the status quo. He loves being bold. He doesn't want to be politically correct. He wants to challenge everything. And so I'm sure when they're in the White House in the Oval Office, Bannon says, hey, Donald, come on, come on, come over here. Come on, let's, let's talk. What do you want to do? Let's shake things up, right? Let's, let's, let's get crazy. And so they, they're whispering in his ear, and they're telling him all sorts of crazy stuff to do. And then he goes out and says it. And then the other pattern is then this side. The old guard comes out and says, yeah, he didn't really mean that. I promise you, he didn't mean that. And it's happening over and over and over again. And it's really telling. Let's talk about some examples. NATO. Does the U.S. still support NATO? Well, Donald Trump gave an interview and he said, NATO's obsolete. This thing was created years ago. We don't need it anymore. It's obsolete. Nobody's paying their dues anymore. We should just get out, right? So he says this, Europe collectively freaks out at this moment, right? This long-standing alliance, they're freaked out. So what does the old guard do? Well, they send in Mike Pence, right? Uh, and Mike Pence comes in and he meets with Angela Merkel. He goes to Munich, he goes to Belgium, and he says, the United States of America strongly supports NATO and will be unwavering in our commitment to this transatlantic alliance. Don't worry, Donald was just up late last night tweeting. He didn't really mean that, he didn't mean it. Um, all right, another example. Will the US send its military into Mexico get the bad hombres? Sort of a weird thing that we're even saying this. But all right, so Donald Trump has a conversation with the president of Mexico. It doesn't go particularly well. In that conversation, he tells the president of Mexico, you have a bunch of bad hombres. He literally said that, and the White House has confirmed that. Uh, bad hombres down there. Uh, you aren't doing enough to stop them. I think your military is scared. Our military isn't. Uh, so I might just send them down to take care of it. Again, the president of the United States talking about sending the US military into Mexico to go get some bad hombres. This, this was not good, right? So you send in the old guard, and this time you gotta send in two. So you send in Rex Tillerson and John Kelly, uh, state and homeland security, to Mexico to say, don't worry, he didn't mean any of that, right? He's just not real good on the phone. Uh, and of course, we're not gonna use the military to invade Mexico and go after battle. No, no, stop it, you're being silly. All right, um, will the US lift sanctions on Russia? Well. 
The Bannonites put this idea in Trump's head and he said, you know what? This is not such a bad idea. Uh, President-elect Donald Trump suggested on Friday he's opening, open to lifting the sanctions. He said, if you get along and if Russia is really helping us, why would anybody have sanctions if somebody's doing something really great things? Right? So Trump says, maybe we'll lift the sanctions. And I love this picture because this is uh, former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn. And remember I said, you know, how they're whispering in his ear? Kind of looks like he's whispering in his ear like, it's time to get a little crazy. And then Trump's like, look at this guy. He's always getting me in trouble. Uh, so, so here's an instance where Trump says something else that is... Uh, a really, really strange and unconventional approach to U.S. foreign policy. So uh, Nikki Haley goes on the floor of the United Nations and says the United States is c condemning Russia. Uh, U.S. sanctions against Moscow will remain in place until they re leave Crimea. Like reaffirming this standard position, the United States is not going to be an ally of Russia until it changes its behavior. And again, this happens over and over. It happened with Israel. Trump comes out and says, well, maybe we'll do a one state or a two state. I don't know, we can try different options. Freaks people out. He says, we'll revisit the one China policy. Freaks China out, right? And so then all of a sudden there's a moderating on both of those positions. But my favorite one, my favorite one is, will the US steal Iraqi oil? Uh, so Donald Trump, he gave a big speech at the CIA. And in that speech, he talked about we should have just kept the oil. Uh, if, we kept, if we keep the oil, probably you wouldn't have ISIS because that's where they made their money in the first place. So we should have kept the oil, but okay, maybe we'll have another chance. I don't care if you're a Democrat or a Republican, if you love Trump, if you hate Trump, that's a crazy position. <laughs> that is genuinely a crazy position saying we're going to invade Iraq and we're taking the oil, right? We're going back like 100 centuries, you know, going way back in time to like stealing oil. You just, you can't do that. All right, so when something like that happens, you got to send in the heavy hitter. So we send in James Mattis, right? So James Mattis, he has to go to Iraq. You can't do this over a phone call. Uh, you can't Skype it in. You got to send Mattis to Iraq where he says, I think all of us here in this room, all of us in America have generally paid for our gas and oil all along, and I'm sure we will continue to do so in the future. And the video of him saying this, he looks so defeated. He's like, come on. We're not going to steal your oil, man. Uh, he, just, he was just, again, he was overtired. He didn't mean it. Uh, so we're seeing a pattern here. This side plants the idea. This guy goes out and says it. And then this side has to go clean it up, right? So it makes you think a little bit about, you know, some commentators have said it's kind of like the guy at the zoo who's cleaning up after the elephant. Somebody goes out to make a mess. And somebody's, all right, here we go. We'll take care of business. All right, so here's, here's the question. Is, does this mean that the Bannonites, the bomb throwers, the radicals, have they won? Are they winning? I think it's too early to say. I think what we're seeing is that they certainly have Trump's ear. And the rhetoric is reflecting a Bannonite view of US foreign policy. But if we think about policy itself and what the United States has done, the old guard is hanging on pretty good. So our NATO policy, our Russia policy, our Israel policy, all of these have been status quo. So as much as these guys have tried to change them and gotten the president to change some things, there's been some status quo policies that are still in effect. So it's, it's early. But I would put to you that this divide that's in the, within the administration right now is the most important one we could think about in terms of US foreign policy. It will dictate what happens over the next four years. If the Bannonites win, if these guys get tired of doing cleanup and they all go away, uh, we would see a fundamentally different U.S. international order on trade, on policy, on terrorism, on relationship with the Middle East. Like things could fundamentally shift. Um, the other thing that's important to think about is the appointment of H.R. McMaster as National Security Advisor. And this kind of seems like a nerdy thing. Does it really matter who's the National Security Advisor? He's very clearly in this camp. He's a pragmatist. He does not believe what this group does. So the fact that Trump replaced Michael Flynn, who was a Bannonite, with somebody who's in this camp, suggests that he's probably got feet in both camps. And so it's a little unclear how this is all gonna play out, but it's terribly important. Another thing to think about is that up until this point, it's the United States that has been pushing the issues, pushing the agenda in terms of foreign policy. So whether it's the travel ban or whatever it is, they've been pushing out. 
Nothing has hit the United States yet in terms of a foreign policy issue, but something will arise. An issue will arise that the administration will have to deal with, and then these two camps will weigh in. And it's at that point that it gets very lonely to be the president of the United States. You've got competing camps, but you're the one who's got to make that decision. And we have to think about whether this individual is ready to make that decision. Do we feel comfortable that he has the, the wherewithal to assess the motivations of these different camps and make the right decision for the country? You can look back through history and think of examples where that president did. John F. Kennedy in the Cuban Missile Crisis, where he had lots of different competing camps and he made the right decision. Still to be determined whether he's in a position to do so. All right, on this final question of whether there's coherence to Trump's incoherent policy, I think so. I think we have to understand these two camps and the fact that one of these camps is looking to seed and sow chaos and destruction as an actual foreign policy. And then there's another side that's trying to slow that down. And how that battle plays out will really tell the future of what's going to come uh, for Donald Trump and U.S. foreign policy. Thank you.